you so much to the uh, organizers of this conference, my consultants, my mentors, um, the various nephrology nurses I have worked with. I've had a very good opportunity to learn from all of you. So I know that the topic Dr. Calder gave me was um, the ideal vascular access um, to give information about that. But is it possible really to have the ideal vascular access? Is there one? We've had two discussions from uh, both Dr. Sokala and Dr. Atuhe, and we know that there's no one ideal vascular access for, you know, one, one, one tailor-made access for everyone. You must individualize your vascular access care. Um, so, so we carried out a study at Kenyatta National Hospital looking at the vascular access profile of patients on hemodialysis. We know that in Kenya, we use the international guidelines to guide how we choose accesses and everything. But from the two discussions we've had, you can see that our patients are different. What they do in the West might not be necessarily what is good enough for us here in Kenya. In 2006, the KDGO guidelines that were released uh, resulted in a positive, um, positive uh, rush towards a fistula first initiative. And everyone was very keen to uh, get patients to have the AV fistula. But uh, soon after, I think it was very clear that um, the maturation and working of the AV fistula was quite unpredictable. And during these periods of time, patients at times required to use a catheter as a bridging access or, you know, they would, the, the fistula wouldn't work at all. So they ended up using um, catheters, both tunneled and non-tunneled. From our discussion, you will see that there are various factors that come in place when ch uh, choosing a patient's vascular access, but it is important for us to know what is on the ground. How do our patients behave? What is, you know, what do they want? And um, yesterday there's a discussion we had where we said that uh, nephrology care should be patient-centered. So this is my outline. Um, my co-investigators, uh, I want to give a special mention to Prof. Uh, A.J. Owere. He was part of my um, co-investigators when we started with the proposal and everything. And he was quite instrumental and I, I dedicate this presentation to him. Uh, I want to give a great shout to Prof. Kaima. He's behind there. Uh, Prof. Makligeo, thank you very much, and Dr. Kalida Soki, and my statistician, Dr. Ken Mudoka, and also to mention the renal nurses in Kenyatta National Hospital who really helped me, they guided me and um, assisted me in collecting the data. So um, CKD rose from being the 36th global cause of uh, death worldwide in 1990 and has risen to be the 19th cause in the, by the year 2013. We know that this, um, this, this is expected to keep rising. For patients who choose hemodialysis, I don't know if our patients really choose hemodialysis, but that's mostly what is available. Um, you know we can have conservative management, and then we can have hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and kidney transplant. For most of our patients, they have hemodialysis either as their definitive management or as a conduit to renal transplantation. So for those who choose hemodialysis or end up having hemodialysis, the vascular access is their lifeline. And the decision surrounding the choice of the vascular access and timing for its creation is very complex. The ideal vascular access planning, uh, and according to Dr. Sokwala's uh, presentation, should begin in the early stages of CKD before the patient requires dialysis. And according to the latest KDGO guidelines, this should be at a GFR of 15 to 20. So according to unpublished data uh, from the Kenya Renal Association Registry, there are an estimated 4 million Kenyans with chronic kidney disease. And out of those, more than 10,000 have end-stage kidney disease. There's been an exponential growth in the number of patients with end-stage kidney disease on dialysis with 300 in 2006. And as of yesterday, I had we have 5,000. Um, there's been a rise in the hemodialysis centers in the country. However, there's been an inadequate rise in, uh, in healthcare workers who are specialized uh, in providing nephrology services, especially those uh, who are involved in vascular access care. The ideal 
Oh yeah, that's a repetition. So for optimal outcomes right now, we need to have the right access for the right patient at the right time for the right reasons. And um, because of this, the prevalence of the different accesses used varies worldwide. Um, and the optimal choice and timing of vascular access creation for each individual is dependent on multiple factors. So we look at the different factors, there are individual factors and then there are system factors. So we need to determine the patient's age. We know that for patients who are older, it might be more difficult to get in an AV fistula uh, because maybe they have, they have comorbidities, they could be having um, atherosclerosis of their, vascular, of, of their vessels and therefore the vascular access might not take. Um, when you look at the sex discrepancy, women are, more, are less likely to have maturation, proper maturation of AV fistulas compared to men. Comorbidities, patients who have heart failure have challenges with AV, fistula, AV fistulas because it can worsen the heart failure. So yes, we're saying that the AV fistula is good, but you have to consider the individual patient. The level of education is quite important for you to manage your access as well. The patient needs to understand very well uh, what the access is, how to take care of it, and you know, ensure its longevity. Um, one thing that we really fail on, we will see the results, is pre-dialysis patient education. A patient who is educated is empowered, and they are most likely going to have, uh, we are going to have better outcomes. Um, it's important to consider the patient's end-stage kidney disease life plan. How long, I mean, what's, how long will your patient be alive? And what do they want? Do they want conservative care? Do they want uh, renal transplant immediately? Are they comfortable with the vascular access? Their patient's socioeconomic status. We know that there are many patients whom we have referred for um, vascular access care, maybe an AV fistula or an AV graft, and they're not able to afford it. And I don't know that is covered in, by the NHF in all facilities. No, um, most of the time, like if you want a patient to buy a um, tunneled catheter, they have to pay cash. 20,000 upfront, not all patients are able to get that um, everywhere. So the patient's vascular anatomy is important and it's also important to consider the patient's uh, personal preferences. So another very important thing that we need to co consider is the processes of care. So um, is, there an is, the, is pre dialysis care available? Like for patients who have CKD three, two, three, is there, is there someone to see them and tell them how to manage themselves? You know, how do we slow down progression of CKD? Timing of referral, are we referring the patients in good time for their vascular access? And uh, from the discussions we've seen here today, so many of our patients are crash landing. Uh, what is the vascular access practice pattern? Which guidelines are we using? Uh, the staff trained on vascular access care and coordination of appointments, you will see that if patients don't get proper coordination of appointments, if you're referring them for vascular access care, they can go missing for so long or they can be taken round and round in circles and they give up. Um, the other important thing is, do we have enough expertise for vascular access cre creation, monitoring and maintenance? And even if we have the expertise for the creation, are we really monitoring our patients? Um, the, another important is the vascular access outcomes. Are we doing well with a CVCs, are we doing well with the AV fistulas? The patient's vascular access satisfaction, you will realize that patients have very specific types of accesses that they like, and they have very interesting uh, reasons why they prefer those accesses. And a very important thing that has not been considered in a while is the patient's vascular access health related quality of life. And you'll see some of the things that we'll highlight based on our questionnaire, um, that was validated in Canada by Queen et al. And you know, things like, does the, your vascular access uh, prevent you from sleeping well? Are you able to have your social activities? Are you sleeping well? Are you, do you have pain? Are you afraid of bleeding from your vascular access? So their health related quality of life really determines the type of access that the patient prefers. Um, so, um, adequate planning ensures successful creation. So the things that we need to note, you should have successful creation, maintenance of a durable long-term access in the pre-dialysis stage of chronic kidney disease. And we need to be proactive in protecting, 
creating and preservation of the next access. So when you get your patient an access, prepare them for the next access because this access can fail at any time and you do not want your patient to be in trouble. You're looking for an access all over and their kidney function is worsening and you know you might lose them. And we should preserve the next access and identify it long before the current one fails. So recent studies have shown that the vascular access related choices and outcomes may be improved by considering the patient's characteristics individually. They should be patient-centered and they should involve a multidisciplinary team composed of experienced nephrology nurses, nephrologists, radiologists, and vascular surgeons. So our question was, what is the vascular access profile of hemodialysis patients at Kenyatta National Hospital? And what determines, determines their choice of access? Our broad objective was to document the types of vascular access utilized by the patients undergoing hemodialysis at KNH and document the factors that determine their choice of vascular access. Specifically, we wanted to find out the proportion of incident vascular accesses and the uh, prevalent vascular accesses, record the number and types of vascular accesses each patient had had during their dialysis vintage. The dialysis vintage is the time, the, the complete time the patient has had dialysis. We wanted to document the vascular access complications that the patients have had during their vintage and uh, demonstrate the impact of the current vascular access on their quality of life using a vascular access questionnaire. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted to document possible factors contributing to the patient's choice of vascular access. So it was a hospital-based descriptive cross-sectional survey at KNH, and our population were adult patients who were seeking hemodialysis for end-stage kidney disease at KNH renal unit for more than three months. So we uh, computed our sample size based on a study carried out by Kabinga et al. in 2018. And we looked at the proportion of the different vascular accesses used. Um, there were 40% for the non-tunnel services, 40 for the tunnel and 14.5 and for the AV fistulas. And based on this um, study, we had a minimum sample of 79 using the Daniel 1999 formula. We applied our eligibility criteria and recruited um, patients consent consecutively until we uh, achieved our des desired sample size. And our case def definition was a person uh, above the age of 18 years with a physician's diagnosis of end-stage kidney disease and documented kidney damage for more than three months, seeking hemodialysis at KNH renal unit. So we included those who met the case definition and gave us written informed consent, and we excluded those who were unable to give us consent, patients who are undergoing hemodialysis for acute kidney injury, uh, those less than 18 years of age, and those who did not have any data on their incident accesses, and patients who had been on dialysis for less than three months. So we had two dependent variables. That was the type of accesses. You know, we have the CVC, it can be tunneled or non-tunneled, the AV fistula and the AV graft. And our other dependent variable was the vascular access core. Um, this is based on a study by Quinn et al, where he looked at 17 things, 17 factors that had bothered the patient uh, in the last four weeks, you know, in the four weeks prior to collecting data about their accesses. And the things that they were looking at are simple things like, um, are you, are you able to sleep in the last four weeks? Have you had trouble sleeping? Have you had pain from your access? Have you been unable to carry out your activities of daily living? Um, have you had challenges? Have you had a bleed? You know, have you been admitted because of your vascular access amongst others? So each uh, of these 17, 17 points was given a score of zero, of zero to five, with five being most bothered, you know, like, if you're really bothered by the access, you score five. So for each patient, when you calculate uh, the total score would be maximum of 85. So patients who scored zero to 17 were not bothered by uh, vasc their vascular access. Um, the ones who are bothered a little were 18 to 34 and so on and so forth, with the ones being extremely bothered by uh, symptoms from their vascular access scoring 85. Uh, you can see our independent variables were age, sex, comorbidities, their level of education, whether they had any pre-dialysis uh, patient education, their socioeconomic status, 
how soon they were referred for vascular access and their uh, personal preferences. So I'll go directly to my results. And um, this is just a, a patient recruitment chart. Um, we recruited 80 patients and then um, went on to analyze their data. So as you can see, most of our participants were quite young. Um, about half of them were, were less than, what do I, you can see, less, less than, um, less than 40 years, about half of our participants are less than 40 years of age. Um, the male to female ratio was not so varied. There were more males, slightly more males, and most of our participants were married. Um, it is important to look at the financial implication. Um, the financial angle, we can see that almost a half of them were unemployed. And uh, then we had 8.8 .8 students and 1.2% uh, retired. So more than half of them did not have good uh, financial muscle. Um, in, and, and of note is that they were quite educated. So you have most of them having uh, more, almost a half having tertiary secondary education and a quarter having tertiary level of education. Um, when you look at the incident vascular access, this is the first access that the patient had. Most of the participants had a non-tunnel CVC as their first access. And for the patients who are continuously going on dialysis at the current access at the time we were collecting the study, majority of them had a tunneled CVC. And um, it's important to note that the AV fistula, which I mean, since 2006 has been promoted as um, the favorable access was quite low at 2.5. And even after the patients had been on dialysis for a while, the most prevalent access, uh, I mean, the AV fistulas were still tailing behind. So when you look at the number of number and types of vascular accesses each patient has had during their vascular access, we had a range of one to zero. There's a patient who had, had only just one access and the highest number of accesses a patient had had in our unit was 20. And the most common access used was a non-tunnel CVC followed by a tunnel CVC. Um, when you look at the specific information about the accesses that were used, you can see that the right internal jugular tunnel CVC was 21%, and the non-tunnel CVC right internal jugular was the highest at 35, 25.6%. And when you look at the brachiocephalic, I mean the AV fistulas, the left uh, brachiocephalic fistula was the most commonly uh, utilized vascular access, vascular location for the vascular access. This is the same thing. Okay, so we, we then um, went ahead to check how many patients had had complications with their vascular access in the last one year. So 38.3% had, 38.3% uh, of our participants had had a problem with the access in the last one year. The most common complication they'd had was an infection at 51.6%, followed by vascular access dysfunction, you know, clotting or inability, poor flows. Um, about 25.8% um, had vascular access related pain. You can see there we also have 6.5% uh, of our participants having bleeding requiring blood transfusion. We know how sensitive we feel about blood transfusion in our renal patients with whom we are preparing for transplant. We'd rather not transfuse them. So I further look, we further looked at the impact of their current vascular access on their quality of life using the vascular access questionnaire that I uh, described earlier on. And this, remember I told you that we uh, scored it, or the, patient, the patients would have a score be, between zero and 85, and this is how to interpret it. So if your patient has a high score, that means they have a poorer quality of life. If a patient has a low score, it's a better quality of life. Um, so when we compare the, the vascular access questionnaire to each type of access, you can see that the patients with an AV fistula had the lowest score. You can see that, 9.4. So it, it was most favorable. And uh, there was a higher score in patients who had, um, there was a higher score in the patients who had a CVC with a maturing AV fistula and those ones who had a tunneled CVC. And then when you look at the um, comparison of the vascular access cause with the patient's demographic um, factors, 
you can see those are significant, those are significant, um, those are significant, what is the word? Well, those are, those are significant correlation when, um, in, when you compare the access type, you compare the score with the access type with every fistula being the least bothering. Uh, those ones who had had a problem with their current access had a higher score. Uh, those ones who are satisfied with their current access had also a lower score, they're very satisfied. And then um, the marital status was actually significant. Those who are married had a worse score. They were unhappy about their vascular accesses. Uh, we also compared the vascular accesses with the gender. Um, the females had a poorer score and patients who are, the patients at the extremes of age, eight, less than 29 and above 60 had better scores, uh, re reported better vascular access, health related um, quality of life. So looking at the education level, um, those are, there, was, uh, there was no significant difference. Yeah, and when you look at the occupation, the patient, there wasn't much change, but you can see um, the patients who had diabetes had a higher, higher score, and those who had hypertension surprisingly had a better score. So when you look at the dialysis vintage patients, so I, we categorized the patients according to how long they had had dialysis, and um, patients who had dialysis for a shorter period of time were more likely to complain about their vascular access, health-related quality of life. Those ones, uh, that's less than three, that is three to six months, and those ones who are 13 to 18 months. Patients who'd had dialysis for a long period of time um, were less likely to complain about their vascular access-related problems. Um, there was no significant difference whether you had your AV fistula on your dominant arm or your other arm. So we, um, so the timing of referral is quite important. You know that if you refer your patient early for vascular access care, they'll most likely be uh, evaluated for a, an AV fistula. So the patient, uh, uh, when you look at our participants who are initiated on hemodialysis, uh, most of our participants presented late to the renal unit and the 77.5% of our participants were initiated on hemodialysis within three months of being diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease. 85% um, were initiated as an emergency, and those 85% uh, had their incident vascular access placed as an emergency. So this tells you that we have quite a number of patients who are crash landing in the renal unit. Uh, only 75% of the patients uh, in our cohort had been reviewed by a nephrologist at any point, that is less than three months before initiation of hemodialysis. But when you look at those who had seen a nephrologist before three months, there were only 21.3%. So we are referring our patients quite late. Um, when you look at the vascular access surgeon, only 7.5% uh, of our participants had been reviewed by a vascular access surgeon at least three months prior to initiation of hemodialysis. And because of that, you can see that um, the number of patients who had an AV fistula uh, attempted before initiation of dialysis were only 7.5%. So that's one area we need to really improve on. So when you look at the pre-dialysis patient education, um, our patients, or 73.1% of our patients were aware of, okay, sorry, 7.5% percent of our participants were aware of the various forms of vascular access at the initiation of hemodialysis. However, even if they didn't know much at the beginning, 73.1% aware of 73.1% 73 were aware of the advantages of having an AV fistula of a, a CVC. And the advantages they listed including uh, having less access related infections, having better flows, ease of bathing, access longevity, it was more aesthetically appealing and um, it was better for, yeah. So the source, of, the source of information were the dialysis nurses, the renal doctors and fellow patients in order of frequency. So because they are in contact with the dialysis nurse a lot, which I think it's important for us to uh, really make sure that 
um, our nurses are in contact with the patients, giving them that information regularly. When you look at the vascular access factors, all the patients reported their, their first vascular access was recommended by their doctor. Almost half of them had a change of their vascular access within the first three months of hemodialysis. And the most common vascular access change to was a tunnel CVC. Remember at the incident accesses, the most common one was a non-tunnel CVC. And the reasons given for changing the vascular access within the first three months included the need to get a definitive vascular access, vascular access infections, um, having an access failure or having vascular access extrusion. Um, about a fifth of our patients reported hospitalization in the last one year, secondary to vascular access uh, related complications. That's quite a big number. A fifth of our patients had a vascular access related complication. So are we um, taking care of, uh, you know, av avoiding CRABSI? And then when you look at the vascular access related causes of hospitalization, 61% were due to infections, 22% due to access bleeding, and 11.1% uh, due to a superior vena cover syndrome. All right, I have given you a lot of data. Can we have a bit of a breather? Are we together? Okay, I know it's quite heavy, but um, I'm almost done. So the reasons, um, so at the time we were collecting the data, 73.7% of our patients were using a CVC uh, for hemodialysis. That's quite a huge number, isn't it? Yeah, however, majority of them reported having been advised to get an AV fistula. And the reasons that they listed for not having an AV fistula included long and coordinated processes, having an AV fistula, a previous AV fistula that never worked, long surgery waiting time. Um, some had a CVC and therefore they did not feel the need to get another access, financial constraints. Some had an AV fistula that was yet to mature and some had been informed that they had unsuitable blood vessels. Um, and some felt that it would interfere with their occupation. This was especially like drivers, people who are working with the heavy equipment. So the participants who had had an AV fistula prior in their dialysis vintage uh, were about half, 47.5%. And out of these, a fifth reported having an AV fistula in their dominant arm. Um, there was not a major change. There was not a major discomfort of having an AV fistula in the dominant arm. However, it caused discomfort in about four of them. And the problems they listed were difficulty conducting household chores and changes in se sensation. 22% uh, of our participants reported having a previous AV fistula that failed. However, only 11.5, that's two patients out of the 18 who had an AV fist, uh, failed AV fistula were offered a corrective procedure. So you can see some of the places where we have gaps here. And however, out of all those who had a previous AV fistula, 77.8% were willing to get another fistula. Um, another factor that we look, looked at was satisfaction with the current vascular access. Most of our participants were satisfied with their current vascular access and felt that their access was easy to use. And more than half of them would recommend their current access to a fellow patient. Their vascular access most preferred was an AV fistula. Um, most participants felt that the nurses also preferred an AV fistula. And we know that the patients really rely on the nurses because of that close contact. So I'm actually done. So on my discussion, our study participants were young people, uh, similar to previous studies carried out on hemodialysis patients at the Kenyatta National Renal Unit. They're expected to be at the peak of their productivity, and therefore they're likely to be affected by, by poor vascular access related quality of life. It is for this reason that efforts should be put in place to secure optimal vascular accesses for them. Uh, hypertension was the most common comorbidity reported and is most likely the result of the underlying kidney disease. And about a third of the participants documented diabetes, which is five times the prevalence documented in the Kenyan population, reinforcing that diabetes mellitus is a major risk factor for end-stage kidney disease in our population. And so when we are targeting patients to be managed or sent for vascular access, I think we really need to work very hard with our endocrinologists. Um, this is the incident, this is the incident of vascular access. So you can see in our, in our population, 
for the patients who start the hemodialysis, most of them will start with an, uh, an internal CVC, which is similar to what Dr. Kabinga had documented in 2018 and Dr. Ndinya in uh, 2016. So we are still using a lot of non-tunnel CVCs. Our patients are still crash landing in the renal unit. And this is compared, when you compare to, to Korea, where's Korea? Did I see it? Okay. I didn't put it, okay. But you can see um, in Australia, most patients are having an AV fistula as their first for vascular access and their AV graft. And they have very, they have guidelines which uh, help them to determine, which I think are assisting to make sure this happens. And this is also the same in Spain. The AV fistula is the initial vascular access. When you look at the, so we postulate that the countries where the CVC is uh, the most common initial access, like in our study, uh, the common reasons include late referrals for comprehensive kidney care, lack or delay of patient education, rapid loss of kidney function and a protracted referral system or lack of expertise in access creation. Uh, when you look at our prevalent accesses and compare to everyone else, the most common prevalent access for us was a tunnel CVC, followed by those patients who had a bridging CVC with an AV fistula. When you look at Korea, most of the patients uh, have an AV fistula. They have a very rigorous system. I will discuss this in a bit. And even when Dr. Ndinya, documented it in 2016, the most common um, prevalence access was still a tunnel CVC. So the AV fistula use is high amongst uh, prevalent patients on hemodialysis studies conducted in Korea, the United States of America and Australia, while the CVC is still the most prevalent one used in Kenya, Iran and Senegal. And you can see, well, we are are we second or third world countries? And this variation may be explained by factors such as local and international guidelines. We do, we do not have local guidelines. Um, in the other countries, they have early referral, they have higher levels of predialysis patient education, and they have uh, expertise to create the various accesses available all over the country, and they have coordinated vascular access programs. So the median number of, in addition to that, the, we can uh, remember I told you that the median number of accesses each patient had had during their dialysis vintage was two, but it ranged from one to 20. And the most commonly used vascular access was a non-tunnel CVC. So catheter use in our study exceeds the NKF uh, recommendation, which indicates that they should be used less in less than 10% of our population. And this may be explained by lateral referrals and lack of a coordinated, dedicated vascular access program. So in addition to that, the most common location used for the CVC was the right internal jugular vein, uh, while the left brachiocephalic was the most common used location for AV fistula. Um, you know, we're not using the, the subclavian much, and therefore the left subclavian was the least uh, used location. This the locations utilized have followed the international guidelines on the choice of vascular access site in order to maximize outcome and reduce chances of complications such as central venous stenosis, which is common after use of the subclavian vein. So 61% uh, of our partic participants reported having a problem with their current access in the last one year. And uh, the, these problems are similar to those found in various studies including a single study in single center study in Egypt uh, by Gonemi et al who documented that 53.7 blood culture positive who documented 53.7 blood culture positive vascular access infections 57% uh, of vascular access related stenosis and 36.9 having aneurysmal complications we had fewer reported complications and this may be explained by either that our patients had um, less information about what those complications were and therefore record, reported fewer incidents. Uh, the particip participants who had late referral in the US and the New Zealand uh, registry were most likely participants who had a high burden of mortality and lacked health insurance. They were more likely to have unplanned initiation of hemodialysis, which is associated with a lot of vascular access related morbidity and mortality and high CVC use with high CVC related admissions. So though our study was not part powered to meet 
the secondary, I'm winding up, though our study was not powered to meet the secondary objective, uh, our exploratory analysis shows significantly lower vascular access questionnaire scores, VAQ scores in patients who had an AV fistula, and those who have not experienced a problem with their vascular access. Those who are very satisfied with their vascular access and in single participants, there were better scores amongst the males, participants at extremes of age, and those who had been on dialysis for more than two years, and those with a tertiary level of education. The predictors for worse score in our participants included being fail, female and having diabetes. So in a similar study conducted in multiple hemodialysis centers in the UK by Field et al, the VAQ score was found to be more, to improve significantly with age. Um, yeah. So I will just go directly to our limitations. We had a lot of recall bias, and this was a hospital-based study in one of the tertiary uh, facilities in Kenya. And our findings may not be generalizable to the rest of the population. It would be good to, to do a large countrywide survey. So uh, this study revealed that the, our population of hemodialysis patients are young, and these are people who are expected to be at the peak performance, yet um, they're not doing well. So for them, having an optimal vascular access is quite important. Um, yeah, so the AV fistula is the least used access, so we are not actually following the international guidelines. Pre-dialysis -ed, pre education is low, and our patient, uh, patients, Hemodialysis VAQ quality relates VAQ related quality of life is likely to be better in participants who have an AV fistula, those who have not had a problem with their accesses, and those who are satisfied with their vascular accesses. So our recommendation is that we need to have a nationwide vascular access coordination program. Um, we need to have a patient education empowerment program, and we need to have timely nephrology uh, referrals. So I'd like to thank. All these people, I know time is gone. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me.